hey, this is Andre Gower from the Monster Squad and the documentary Wolfman's Got Nards, and you are listening to Scarifier. And Gov and Quinn are in the goddamn club. <laughs> All right, guys, we have a very special treat for you guys. Gov, what do we have going on today? Well, today at Scarefire, we have very, very special guests we're talking to today. So special that the Gov is sweating currently because he is an absolute hero to me. Um, his film meant a whole lot to me. May I present the leader of the Monster Squad, Mr. Andre Gower. How are you doing today? Uh, hey guys, I am I'm doing doing pretty good. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much again for taking the time out of your day to talk to us. We really appreciate it. Uh, now this is gonna be fun, and I'm looking forward to it. All right, so right off the bat, um, I always want to know, especially when we're talking to special people like this, what got you started in your field? What what got you caught the acting bug? Well, when the alien mothership got lost and dropped me off on planet <laughs> uh, and decided to leave my sister as well, um, you know, and then it just kind of went haywire from there. <laughs> um, no, uh, in really what it was, I, I mentioned my sister because that's uh, is sort of the, the, <laughs> the reason we're talking. Uh, she's responsible for all of this, whatever it is. Uh, my sister is a few years older than I am, and uh, she and my parents had uh, moved to L.A. Uh, when she was very young uh, from Central California, and had, she was uh, she was big back in the day when uh, pageants were a thing, um, unlike they are today. It's not like toddlers and tiaras back right, then; right, it was yeah. this whole other type of thing. And uh, you know, uh, I, I think my mother had always. Uh, uh, been attracted by the you know kind of the the world and the lights and the and 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 the industry itself uh you know growing up in a small town in north carolina uh that my mother did and then when my sister had the opportunity to you know do tv and print and commercials and things like that uh, i think it was a, a very quick decision and you know my parents and my sister i was not around yet um, I, I don't. I also wasn't on the agenda. I think I was sort of a little surprised. Oh. Uh, and so, you know, they moved down to LA, and my sister started working, um, and had, had had worked quite a bit as a kid. Uh, and then, you know, surprise, um, here I come. And uh, so, I was just sort of always around it because my sister started at a very young age, uh, and when I was about five, I started. Uh, you know, I was always around uh, on, you know, on her locations or on her shoots or, you know, commercial sets or film sets. And then it was just sort of, I guess I was next. <laughs> Your turn. And, uh, my turn. And, you know, when you look at it, you know, with, with parents, with, with young kids, like, I mean, young kids, you know, five, six years old, yeah. uh, you know, the kid, the kids aren't making these decisions. Let's, you know, let's, let's be honest. Mm. Uh, but what I think in my situation um, and, and, you know, my sister's situation as well, um, uh, that it was at least, hey, let's see if you're interested in this. Is this something that, you know, you're not terrified of or <laughs> that you are com at least comfortable with? And, uh, you know, with me, I think it was something that either by nature or nurture or by, you know, luck or by force that I, I just kind of took a shine to it. You know, I was I was comfortable with it, I think, because like I mentioned, I was always around it and it wasn't foreign to me uh, to when it was just sort of, my turn to step up and, you know, be, be in the middle of it. And I just, you know, I always say it was sort of like a duck to water, I guess. And I was just never really uncomfortable in it or around it. And, you know, I don't know if that's always the case with every kid. Um, you know, some are just not comfortable with it. Um, you know, did I have other interests and things that I like to do? Absolutely. And, you know, growing up as a young kid and then, you know, a preteen and a teenager and, uh, you know, you always try to, you know, you try to balance those other things. 
And I, I you know, as the as the run went on, because um, you can only have, a, you know, your run as a kid actor is finite. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you, know, you, you, you know, we can't, you know, I don't know if we can or not, but we can't, you know, you know, genetically alter our kids like we do our dogs to stay little and small. <laughs> 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 and, uh, you know, it's uh, I, I had a good run and uh, I enjoyed it. I also had a very balanced life on the other side of it, whereas when I was not working, uh, I loved going to school, like real school, like regular school. And, you know, so that was a big part of, you know, a big part of the picture there. And then when I was working, I loved doing that as well. But I was active with a bunch of friends, either from school or from sports or, you know, from outside the business. And I also had this whole other world that I existed in parallel, uh, you know, with friends in the industry and friends on sets and in films and TV. And, you know, I was very active. I played a lot of sports and was very active as a kid so that's a hard that's a hard thing to balance all of that but I think we did a pretty good job so what do you think is the reason why a lot of like child actors can't find that balance why I mean I guess for lack of a better term like why are there so many like child actor tragedies versus someone like you who sounds like you handled it very well um you know honestly I think it's a uh, uh, it's really who you have around you doing all of that balance whether the focus is it's just this and only this you're going to probably have some problems down the line uh you know honestly you know you take any group of uh you know let's just say american kids and and you're going to have you know a small number that just you know end up having problems regardless of what they're doing Mm -hmm. you know whether they were in the tv and movie business or not uh, but a lot of it has to do with your the the structure and the and the support system around you who's involved in your life and in your career. Um, and a lot of those times, there's a correlation where, you know, if you made a list of young actors that ended up with problems or ended up with um, issues, uh, you were probably find a lot of connectivity to the fact that they didn't have a very strong support structure around them or the st- support structure around them weren't the greatest individuals maybe right. uh, that should that should be doing that for young kids and, and that really is a hard balance to do that not everyone can achieve you know what i mean so i do admire you and your family for being able to do that you know yeah i mean and honestly you know you know I mean, God, I'm not anywhere near young anymore. And it's, um, you know, you look back and you're like, you know what? Of the things that you may have thought were restrictive when you were a kid or, you know, kind of, uh, you know, annoying or frustrating uh, because, you you know, we we did a pretty good job because I know a lot of, you know, still some of these people are, you know, my friends. You know, these are lifelong friends. And, you know, there's a handful that, you know, can do can can walk down the street and not get hit by a bus <laughs> and there Which are the some talent. that you are absolutely surprised how they walk down the street and not get hit by a bus <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> but that's also with everybody <laughs> that's, that's, that's just a true. human thing for me i guess it's, just, <laughs> it's not just kids in the business but uh you know it, it certainly is and uh you know it depends on your experience in the business whether you know you were on a show for 10 years uh, you know, look, if you're on a show for 10 years and you basically go to all of your schooling on set, you are not going to have that experience of going to fifth grade or 10th grade um, and, and and not have that social interaction. Uh, you're probably going to learn really well because there's some great studio teachers. And if you get a great structure, you're going to learn a lot of information, mm-hmm. but you're not going to have sort of that, uh, you know, absorption of just experience over the time. And you know, you're, you're limited. Um, I kind of look back at my career and my TV and film kind of, uh, path and realize that, uh, you know, everybody always points out my resume. It's like, dude, you had the amazing guest star role and you were on all these amazing shows and you did so many television shows and series. And I was like, yeah, you know, there's the reason I had an opportunity to do all these, you know, kind of great, you know, guest spots on these awesome shows like Knight Rider and, you know, the A-Team and mm-hmm. things like that. It's because if you also look at this, uh, you know, the resume of television series that I was a part of, I was the kid that did, you know, five or six television shows that only went one season <laughs> or two seasons. I wasn't the kid that did one show for 10 years. Right. right. And 
what that does is that afforded me the opportunity because I was available to do all these other things. Um, you know, there's a lot of kids that, you know, get on these awesome, great shows for 10 years, which is what you want. And that's all they've, they haven't really had the opportunity to do anything else. So it's sort of talk about a balance, you know, there's kind of a, you know, a weighing of the pros and cons of, of, you know, what you get to do in this business as a kid. And mine shook out, uh, you know, at the end is that I had, you know, just sort of this wide swath of experience in different shows and, uh, you know, and availability to do these, you know, other great things. So I think that also added one to the experience and sort of the acumen that you grow up with and, and learn instead of just having one experience. We feel now is the best time to tell you that Scarifier are proud supporters of Rue Morgue. Rue Morgue is the world's leading horror and culture and entertainment brand, spearheaded by its multiple award-winning magazine, Rue Morgue and Rue Morgue Digital. But if reading is not your thing, that's okay, because there's Rue Morgue TV, the official YouTube channel, as well as Rue Morgue Cinema, which produced the acclaimed original film, The Last Will and Testament of Rosalind Lee. So head over to RueMorgue.com and subscribe to Rue Morgue Magazine magazine for your bi-monthly slice of horror culture and entertainment today. All right, so with that, with your start, what led you to the Monster Squad? Yeah. You know, it was, uh, let's all go back to, you know, the summer of 1986, um, you know, and, and, and at this time, you know, I had been working quite a bit. I was, um, you know, somewhat of a working name, you know, some, you know, kind of this, uh, you know, just coming off of a, a, a handful of shows and guest spots, like we just mentioned. And, uh, you know, I was working quite a bit, but, you know, this is really just a regular audition, you know, situation. And, you know, what happens, you know, in this industry is, you know, there's, there's a show or a movie and there's parts and they get listed out and they get sent to the agencies and the agents submit their clients that think would work for certain roles. And then the casting director says, yes, let's let's read those people. And that's basically casting in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. And um, until you get to a certain point where you just start getting requested for things. And this was sort of at that time where I started to get into that area where, you know, I, I didn't go on like kind of cold first auditions or submissions. I, you know, I would get requested to come in for read for this or for that and, or just get straight cast for it, which is a great spot to get into. But, that you know, that takes a while. Mm. Um, so, you know, the, 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 you know, the breakdowns come out for this, you know, kind of studio monster kid movie. And uh, I get submitted to go audition for it. And, you know, a lot of Monster Squad fans, you know, know this story, but some don't. So uh, it's always fun to, to, to explain it to them. I never auditioned for the role of Sean Crenshaw. Right, you uh, you went for Rudy, didn't you? That's right. So it's, um, Aaron knows his stuff here. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, it, because of, and this is a perfect example of how the industry works, especially with kids, uh, but with adults as well. You know, when you have a look or a style or you, you've been seen a number of times in a certain way, uh, that's sort of what you're going to get, you know, kind of thought of for. And, you know, the, a couple shows prior leading up to the Monster Squad summer of auditioning, uh, I, you know, I'd been the, the, the kid with, uh, you know, awesome hair and a ton of hair product and maybe a leather jacket in there or two. And, you know, so automatically you're going to, you know, Rudy's going to be the role that jumps out to your to your agents. And, yeah, I went through the audition process of Rudy and, and you know, audition and callbacks and another callback and, um, you know, producers meeting and screen tests and all that. And. Uh, never, ever read one line of dialogue of Sean Crenshaw. And, which is very rare in the fact that, you know, a few weeks after that, you know, your agent calls and um, uh, they said, hey, you know, that movie that you read for a couple weeks ago, uh, which, by the way, you usually have to ask which one. Um, <laughs> because that's, you know, you're reading, you have at least one audition. And on average, you usually have one to three to five or auditions a day. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, you know, in, in some sort of, like, kind of peak mode there. And, uh, you know, you say, which one is, oh, that Monster Squad movie with the monsters. And But they didn't cast you. You didn't get the role that you read for. And, you know, normally that's a bad thing. Right. Because they, 
they cast someone else that was better for the role that you read for, and you usually get a lesser role, like, you know, maybe a day or two on it or some smaller character. And for some reason, uh, and now over the last, you know, number of years, I've realized that all of this stuff that we've been talking about with Monster Squad and, you know, which leads to, you know, leads to something like, you know, a documentary Wolfman's Got Nards that we get to make. And because of this crazy 30 year, you know, uh, history that this movie, ha- I mean, 34 year history that this movie has, um, somebody in the group, whether it was the casting director, Penny Perry or Fred Decker himself or Shane Black or Peter Hine, you know, somebody that was in those rooms when they were deciding on who they were going to tap to be Sean Crenshaw, which is the lead of the movie, um, they they read everybody in town for all these roles, and that was you know sort of the point you know I was making earlier is you're you're everybody's auditioning for everything, and everybody read that should have looked and sounded like Sean Crenshaw that you can think of. They were on the list. I'm, they auditioned for it. Same thing with the cool kid Rudy. I know what happened. I auditioned for Rudy, and you know I probably did a, a, a decent job, but Ryan Lambert came in. And absolutely murdered his auditions for Rudy mm-hmm. and became Rudy, you know, in that moment. Because I know the story because we've been so close for so many years and he's told the story and I know exactly what happened, you know, on that day, uh, even though I wasn't there. And I understand that. And Ryan became Rudy in that moment. And there is no better Rudy. Could I have been Rudy? Sure. I would have been a little campier, a little more, you know, cor- probably a little bit corny. Ryan brought this kind of really deep authentic version of what Rudy ends up being and it goes even deeper it's 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 a, it's a much more vulnerable kind of you know deep-seated character that needed to be part of this group and I don't think I would have even thought of of, of that um, at the time uh, but somebody in the group said hey we've read everybody in town for this role of Sean Crenshaw um, and we just haven't it hasn't really clicked like we haven't found this kid and somebody I still don't know who that is um, and I, you know what? I just had, I just had a, I just, I just hung out with Fred the other day and, uh, I should have, I, 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 just, I should ask. Um, but, um, somebody in the group said, Hey, what about that Andre kid that we, that read for Rudy five times? Uh, what if we, you know, wash his hair and give him a bad haircut and give him some <laughs> ill-fitting clothes? Uh, you know, could he be Sean? And apparently the group said, you know what, whoever person X is, uh, yeah, that's it. And so whoever that person is, is is the reason that I get to sit here and talk about being Sean Crenshaw. Oh, wow. That must have been a surprise, though, when you did get that call. Hey, you didn't get Rudy, but they want to put you as the lead. That's right. I, you know, I'm. Uh, I've I've been around this industry a while, and you know I'm no, you know I certainly wouldn't tap myself as an expert, but I have some experience. I don't know how many times that has happened, so it's, I don't know, <laughs> and it's probably a small club of people. So I just think that's kind of a neat uh, uh, a, a neat group to be in, I think. And um, but with that said, you know, I was disappointed, <laughs> so even though they're like, no, 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 you got the lead of the movie. I'm like, no, but Rudy's the cool kid. Like, yeah, he just, you know, he's got the jacket and he gets to kill more monsters, and you know, he gets the girl at the end. Like, that's the role you want. And uh, but honestly, uh, I know for a fact that everybody ended up exactly where they should have been. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, all around and perfect casting, yeah. in my opinion. Um, so what qualities uh, did you do you think you presented in your auditions for Rudy that they grabbed to and said, like, there's our Sean? You know, probably. um you know, just kind of the confidence in, in an overall of what these kids are experts in, because you know they're they're the they're the nerds of the neighborhood, and you know they're the geeks of the treehouse, and but what and that's just on the surface. But these kids are actually really into the stuff that they like, and they they know all about it. They read the books, they've read the literature, you know, they watch the movies, they read the magazines, you know, they know everything there is to know about monster lore. Uh, it, so much so that they have a test, <laughs> and, yeah. uh, you know, and, and I, I think maybe, you know, bringing in with Rudy, cause he's certainly a confident character on the outside, um, and, and, you know, stands up to the bullies and, you know, saves Horace and, uh, you know, is sort of the older, cool, protective kid, uh, of the group. Uh, it, and I think sort of that kind of, that might've oozed out a little bit, um, you know, into, 
you know, maybe this kid has confidence enough to be at least the leader of a, a, a group of dorks, which <laughs> apparently I shined at <laughs> you know, and probably still do. And, uh, you know, but he's confident in what he knows and, and, and it doesn't matter what other people think. Um, you know, maybe a little bit of, of, a, of a leadership kind of, you know, aura and the fact that, um, you know, he, he's, he, he may be kind of an insufferable know-it-all and likes to boss people around a little bit. I don't know. Maybe, maybe these are all natural traits that <laughs> kind of shine at that moment. But, um, you know, like I said, luckily someone saw that. And, you know, I think that's what Sean is. I mean, Sean's comfortable and confident in what he knows. And, he, you know, he's so confident in the fact that he will home make the nerdiest shirt of all time. <laughs> And have the balls to wear it to school. But that's, I think, what's so great about the Sean character is he's a solid character. Do you know what I mean? Like, sure. he knows yeah, there's, exactly there's no, where he is, you know? Yeah. And I think that's where that kind of confidence and, and, you know, obviously this group needs some sort of leadership role. And he's like, that's me. Yeah. Exactly. I, I mean, even in your opening scene in the principal's office, like you have no problem telling the principal uh, what the drawing is. It's a spider with that's a human head. Right. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, just because you don't know what it is, uh, uh, what's it, uh, Mr. Metzger, uh, yeah. doesn't mean that we don't know what we created here. This is. <laughs> if you were in such a doof, you would read our comic book that we make. <laughs> <laughs> so. I I do have a question that's not completely off topic, but just kind of like, let's segue to the right just slightly. Um, We just finished talking to David Weiner, who did the um, In Search of Darkness docu-series. And um, we've seen it, and we noticed that you were on there. And my question is, what about the 80s? I really want your opinion on this. What about the 80s makes it so prominent, especially for horror genre well I think it's uh, the horror genre um, it just also gets affected by everything else that got affected by the things we call the 80s mm-hmm. and if and if you go back and you know depending on how old you know you are as you're listening to this or how old you were back then if you understood what was going on in the 80s and none of us did because we were kids uh, you know, I was a kid, but you understood so this amazing dynamic of what was going on. We were coming out of um, uh, a kind of sloggy, bad history. You know, the Vietnam era. Mm-hmm. We're coming out of the '70s. We're coming out of the disco era, which was just sort of the big, sort of led to the '80s. Um, and you know, sort of like success and 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 and, and self indulgement. Uh, but also, it was this period of un mitigated kind of advancement. You know, the 70s were sort of, you know, a little bit stagnant. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, because they were, I think the 70s were just dealing with the 60s. Yeah. I you know, and the 60s were a revolt of the 50s. And the 70s just sort of seemed like, well, we're the 70s and we're just sort of like, we have, just have to just kind of, you know, re- re- recover from the 60s. <laughs> and uh, But then here comes the 80s with technology and economic success and world politics, you know, takes a giant you know, kind of leap forward and, and, you know, pop culture. It's not even pop culture until later. And you call it pop culture. It's just, you know, your, your, you know, music and films and TV, which just exploding and you had so much more diverse range of a ton of stuff. Exactly. And I, I think horror genre is always a commentary on social issues no matter what decade you're going in and you can track back to everything that's going on the uh, you know go back to the what we term horror genre in the 50s and early 60s were a direct result of the atomic age which was brand new unknown scary as shit you know to anybody uh, to, to people that don't know what it is and definitely to people who knows what it is yeah. and what it can do and you know that's why we get these films like you know them and you know irradiated you know you know, monster beings from the bottom of the ocean that become Godzilla. Mm. And they're always social commentaries. Now look at what the social commentaries of what you can nitpick during the eighties in this time of self-indulgence and, you know, kind of selfishness or, um, you know, 
the just sort of it, it was the decade of the individual. Yeah. And everybody, you know, there was, you know, this is just the greatest time ever. We have this great music and these great TV shows and these great cars and look at the shirt. I can put my collar up and it'll stay. And, you know, these amazing <laughs> colors. And, you know, it, you look back at 80s fashion and it almost seems like a cliche, but there was a broader range of let's just look at the clothes that we would wear in the 80s than any other time. It's true. I mean, you had different styles. I mean, you had t 10 or 12 different you know, leading styles of clothes that would be popular. You know, you had, you know, hairband and heavy metal style. You know, you'd wear, you know, skinny black jeans with a studded belt and a concert t-shirt and you had long hair. But then your friend next to you would be, you know, the Muffy or the Buffy and, you know, wear a sweater tied around their shoulders with a popped collar and, you know, some feathered hair. And then you'd have, you know, kind of, you know, the beginnings of the goth kids and the, the, the alternative music and kids walking around looking like Robert Smith, you know, from The Cure. And, you know, because we had this invasion of music that was totally different and, and would affect everybody differently. And I think movies always reflect that. Uh, but then horror genre is always a reflection of the individual or groups of, of, a, of a social, you know, kind of era. And, you know, now we start getting these, you know, kind of either super corny uh, slasher movies you know, like, uh, you know, Death on Sorority Row or, you know, Slumber Party Massacre. Or, uh, you know, you, you get these kind of like surface area kind of romp through, you know, the college campus and you get your head cut off. Mm -hmm. But then you, you also have things like, um, I mean, Friday the 13th started earlier, obviously, but you got how and so did Halloween. But they started to get popular in this one kind of slow moving, trudgy monster evil character that is killing the kids that are always doing something they shouldn't be doing. Right. And, you know, that's a little commentary. Also look at something like Motel Hell. Um, you know, I wrote a little thing for um, uh, for Shudder, uh, The Bite, a long time ago, and I had to talk about Motel Hell. And I realized that, you know, Motel Hell is just a commentary on the era as well. And what's more Americana than the roadside motel? Mm -hmm. right. uh, well, what's more Americana than a roadside motel that the – the innkeepers grow human sausage and kill them and, and make them into their breakfast. <laughs> oh, uh, you know, because it takes all types of critters. And, you know, it's one of those things where, it, you know, I mentioned Motel, Motel Hell and, uh, you know, Slumber Party Massacre. And those are kind of cheesy, you know, takes on it. But then we started getting some really dark horror. And, you know, if you really get in, if, if you think space horror, you know, things like Alien and, uh, or Aliens and, you know, th those are those are horrifying sci-fi movies, but people always want to put it into, you know, the, the horror genre. Um, and you can put it whatever category you want to. It's, it's, it's made for you to enjoy however you want to, damn it. And um, but then I'm always terrified. I think the biggest the biggest thing that happened in the 80s in horror was the fact that we came up with what I think is the scariest individual bad guy uh, is Freddy Krueger. Oh, Yes. Because he he's not real. He mm -hmm. you, he's he's in your mind, and that's what's happening in the '80s. Like we're now going so deep into ourselves that our in you know like the bad guy is in our own mind, and you know that's 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 you can't fall asleep. You know, which is our favorite thing to do is you get him to take a nap, and now this guy will come out and kill you. Mm -hmm. um, so that was terrifying to me, but I think that was a product of the '80s, and sort of this. Uh, you know, because what Freddy Krueger's origin story is, you know, he gets, you know, burned by the townspeople because, you know, they didn't like him. And, you know, he gets, you know, now he comes back and haunts them and, and takes his revenge uh, in this kind of non existent realm, you know, in, in the sleep realm. And, the, you know, he's mad at everybody because they singled him out and, you know, they took advantage and, and, and got rid of him and killed him because they didn't like him. And they took it upon themselves in a selfish manner to get rid of him. And here's his revenge. And I, I think Freddy is is absolutely probably the, the most terrifying type of horror you can have because he does he doesn't exist he's in mm -hmm. your mind, right. uh, and I think that was a commentary of the eighties as well. But then we had awesome fun stuff too. You know, you could, there was so much made because we because of the success, the economic success of the eighties, we you know studios got to make a bazillion things, <laughs> and it's not even close to the content that we're churning out now. But it was huge for back then. And horror was always sort of this enjoyed Saturday matinee or late night, you know, at your home type of thing, which you could also start doing. 
uh, because you could make a, a movie that wasn't really great and it spends a weekend or two at the box office and then it goes to the video store and it makes money because people will go out and buy some crappy, what they think is low budge B movie horror. And there's an audience out there that absolutely loves it exactly. because we're having sleepovers and we're having, you know, your friends over, you know, from high school or from college and you get to enjoy that in a whole new media. And the technology that, the, you know, the Betamax or the VCR brought to you was just, you got to see more stuff. We're the Monster Squad. To kind of um, reach back to the Monster Squad, since we are talking about society, I know that in um, the Wolfman's Got Nards documentary, you touch upon uh, the political incorrectness and how it wouldn't fly today. When you were making the film, was that ever considered by like Fred Decker or Shane Black as they were writing it, or did they think it was just all in good fun? Well, I also think the most of the stuff that is what would someone term potentially problematic today in dialogue in this movie. Uh, no, that it wasn't. That was just how. And here, here's the here's the hard thing because there's a there's a yes there's a larger conversation here but here's the simple answer when you ask about things from 1987 or things from 1977 or things from 1957 that was that was the vernacular that was the dialogue that's how kids spoke to each other right mm-hmm. uh, the hard thing for people that find it problematic today to understand or to accept is and you know what they still do. The problem is, or not the problem, is uh, the difference is now there's a conversations about it. And if it's wrong, then we're having these conversations with kids and they're just they're being molded and conditioned differently, which is a good thing. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, And what we should be doing is celebrating the fact that we can now have these conversations about words or phrases or, you know, uh, you know, uh, situations uh, that we don't want to perpetuate much anymore you should celebrate that instead of um you know lambasting and trying to you know think that it's a, wasn't a you know a nuclear reactor leak that you got to pour a uh, thousand metric tons of concrete over so no one ever hears the echo of it again right uh because what you're doing is when you erase any when you erase anything that you're having current conversations on you lose the context of why you're having the conversation about it exactly Exactly. And that's a tough thing to do. And look, some people, I, look, all disclosure, I am not condoning any behavior. I'm not condoning language. Uh, but you also have to understand that uh, language of the time. Like I've been asked, was like, as a kid, how do you feel about saying that? I was like, actually, if you look in the, I don't really say a lot of things that are problematic. Mm-hmm. My character does. And by the way, I was a 13 year old kid reading something that someone words other person wrote that someone else is telling me where to stand and say them. Right. right. And uh, so when people attack kids, you know, that were actors in the 70s or, or, or 80s or 90s or even 2000s, um, th- there's there's no difference. And then in the act, the adult actor today reading a line of dialogue, it's it's your one at your job. And two, it's it's usually now probably part of the reason it's in there as a conversation. And if you have a moment to spare to look at the broader picture, you might see that these words are in on a page for 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 that specific reason to lead to those conversations to say, hey, this is a problem. Mm -hmm. Right. And if you look at Monster Squad, most of the stuff you get is, uh, you know, with what the bully kids Right. Who are not the nice ones, the examples of how not to be in your school or in your neighborhood. They're the ones that call, you know, Horace, you know, what is now a homophobic slur. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and, and everybody understands that and knows it was back then as well. But it was more of a, of, of a pejorative between, you know, youth groups and kids. Um, and th- they get their come up like they get they're just desserts you know these these bullies are the example exactly and you know it's even whether it was intentional or not by fred decker and shane black in 1987 it ends up becoming exactly that like hey here's this is a perfect example the kids that are saying the mean shit are the ones that either get their ass kicked or get their 
you know, just desserts at the end. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's and that's what, that's what you want. You know, the, you know, the, the, the villain, you know, that's the whole story arc and, you know, a positive ending with a villain. Like he's the guy, he treats everybody mean and then he dies at the end. You know? Right. <laughs> that's the villain. Um, and, and what's interesting now is it's, I, I don't get into it much because the knee jerk reaction of not, being able to look at broad picture, have con context, and or having a conversation that has any type of context or comprehension or reason in it, it's very hard to have those conversations today. And that's what's that's the real unfortunate thing. Um, and so I, I don't get into it a lot because you just bang your head up against the wall a little bit. Um, and it's not that I don't understand what someone on the other side of a discussion is trying to say, uh, but the fact that you will cut somebody off immediately before you've even entered the conversation, right? Then we get problems. And you know, I, I mean, there was an issue this week with a professor that was reading a book and got fired. Yeah, <laughs> what? Read, reading a book in the curriculum of of, of a very major university, uh, and also contextualized what she was going to read and got fired for it. And I don't know, that's tough. I, I, you know, that's, that's either, that's either some really weird, you know, the, the way the wind blows that knocks your tent over and destroys your house, or there's something, you know, deep down and sinister behind it because it's just, it, we're, we're killing all, all, all reason yeah. and discussion to even have conversations about anything that happened in the past. <laughs> you know, yeah, there's some bad stuff that's happened in the history of human civilization. We, and you're lucky enough, whatever generation you're in, whether you were born in 1900 or 2000, to be able to talk about the past because we've kept and archived it in some way, shape or form for you to learn from it. And we can all understand exactly everything that has happened to us. Um, and, I, and I think that's where conversations are, are, are losing today. Uh, but again... Um, this sort of con, you know, this kind of con construct of, of, of killing words and killing, you know, and, 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 and deleting people that were a part of something that they really didn't have anything to do with. Yeah. This revisionist history. I'm yeah. all up. Yeah. I'm all up for the conversations. Uh, I've been, and I'm not defending or condoning or championing anything. Uh, I'm also not out there looking for scalps. Yeah. And, you know, so that's tough. So, you know, we, we've had those conversations and we learned that with Monster Squad very early, actually at the very first cast reunion screening um, that happened in 2006, which led to the resurgence. And we're sitting there celebrating the fact that there's two sold out theater audience of a movie that we thought no one had ever seen that died 19 years prior in the box office. Um, and lo, here comes someone with a, a question pertaining to that and we were like whoa okay this is a conversation uh let's look at that because now we're being brought into the yeah great oh, un, awesome great conversation let's look at it and figure out what it is um and i think we've handled that through the years you know fairly well but aaron like you brought up in wolfman's gotten hards Again, long ta tangent, and I will stop talking in a second. <laughs> you're fine. But, um, Dude, you're so interesting. It, you keep, yeah. The, you know, we knew, uh, you know, when I say we, uh, myself and uh, my main kind of filmmaker, producer, Henry McComas, that made the documentary with me, and even, uh, you know, people like, uh, you know, Wes Caldwell, uh, you know, who had a very small production team on this documentary, and it looks like you had an entire movie lot behind you of people and, and, and stuff. And that a very small, awesome group of people uh, led by my man, Henry McComas. And we would sit and was like, OK, we are going to address this because it's going to get addressed whether we want it to or not. Um, let's look at the best way to bring it up. How do we approach it? How do we address it? How do we put it out there? Because it's really you got to put something out there and let people discuss it. And do we. Do we put a whole, do we dedicate an entire chapter to it? No, because then I think you're pointing fingers and, you know, uh, saying, yeah, this is bad just as a, uh, 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 a deft political move. And so what we did is we addressed it in the first five minutes of the documentary, put it out there and explain the fact that 
we were in a class, a college classroom, a current day college classroom with 95% of the kids in this classroom had never seen the Monster Squad before. Mm -hmm. Okay, they just saw it. Now let's discuss the things that they reacted to. And that's what we did. Mm -hmm. And what that did is we opened, we literally opened the documentary with that and saying, hey, because we are going to be talking about in the next 90 minutes about this 30 year history and a, a, a movie that is continuing to find an audience in some way, shape or form, whether it's by straight second generation, <laughs> you know, by offspring of original fans or by new viewers, whether they're now seeing it streaming on Hulu or Netflix or Amazon, which it's been on all three <laughs> mm -hmm. over the years, or they're finding some friends old DVD uh, or old VHS. Um, but this is amazing because it's 30 years later and a whole new crop of 20 year old, 18, 19, 20 year olds get to experience this. What are they reacting to? Because the other thing we're interrogating in the whole concept of the documentary is what were, what was it that the original fans connected to yeah. and related to and were impacted by to make them be connected to this movie for 30 years? And we didn't just concentrate on them. We opened the documentary with the new kids that are seeing it for like a college class that's getting assigned for them to watch it. They may or may not have ever come across this movie in their lives. Right. But now they're sitting watching it in, in, in a group setting and, and in, in a setting that you can have a discussion on with two of the kids that were in the movie in front of the class with their teacher. So I thought that was an awesome experience. Like, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I'm going to go ahead and throw myself out. I don't want to disclose my age because, you know. I'm a woman. I don't do that. Uh -huh. So <laughs> I remember the first time I did ever see this movie. It was actually because of you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I turned her on to it. Uh, we yeah. were sitting and we were talking about what episode we wanted to do. And he mentioned, let's do Monster Squad. And I said, what? And he looks at me and he goes, OK, you can no longer be a part of the team unless you see this movie. <laughs> I have to have you see this movie. So I got part it. part of the criteria. No, exactly. <laughs> um, my job was on the line. It really was. <laughs> so I sat down and I watched it and he got back and he's like, so what do you think? I said, how have I not seen this? This is so amazing. It's an unseen gem. And he's like, there's actually a humongous crow following. So as I started to go into different social groups and everything like that, um, on social media platforms primarily, you mentioned this movie and it blows up. And I had no idea that it had such a huge following and support. Like, you say Monster Squad and all these people pop up. Mm -hmm. It's insane. And to me, that's huge. So, um, I mean, were you guys expecting it to have, like, what was your reaction finding out that it did have this massive impact and people get very connected to this film. People get very emotional with this film. And to me, that's beautiful. I mean, how did it make you guys feel that you were a part of that? Well, it really, it actually took a, a few years to realize that, that that deep impact and that emotional and, you know, tether that people had to this movie actually affected their lives, yeah. you know, to some extent. And even if it was just as, you know, as low on the spectrum as I've just always liked this movie and I watch it at least once a year. Mm -hmm. Or it's like, this is the movie me and my brother watch together every year, like when, when I come home for Christmas or something. And that all the way, all the way from that low end of the kind of connection spectrum all the way to the high end was like, this is the movie that made me become an effects artist or this is the movie that made me become a screenwriter. Exactly. And, or this is the movie that made me become a, a cop or, you know, a counselor or something because of the, 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 you know, me thinking of how this movie impacted me. That took a while actually because at the very beginning, you know, I mentioned the original cast reunion screening that we had at the Alamo Draft House in 2006. We were surprised that someone was calling wanting to watch this movie again and, and bring us in, you know, to, to watch it with us. And then we saw the reaction of how many people – they sold out two shows the Saturday before, you know, Easter in Austin, Texas. Oh, wow. And we were like, whoa, this is kind of cool because we were like there's either going to be 18 people there <laughs> and four of them were going to be us. <laughs> uh, or, you know, we just had no idea because all, we, all the experience that we had physically – 
uh, is the very low amount of people that went to the theater to see this movie in 1987. Now, granted, we knew that it was on VHS and people watched it on HBO, but we didn't realize the 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 impact it had on individuals that led to the impact on other individuals. And we didn't learn that until even years later after 2006. And so we actually thought this little kind of bump of attention, you know, that, that, that spawned from that 2006 screening, because all of a sudden a year later, we're co-headlining a giant horror convention in New Jersey called monster mania. Mm -hmm. And we're like, wait, isn't this like a giant thing? And like why are – and it was us and the cast of – I think they had done Saw 3 by that time or 2. Maybe it was just 2. And I was like, oh, Shawnee Smith is going to be there. Cool. I haven't seen her in 20 years. Let's go hang out with Shawnee Smith. <laughs> and – but then like we were like, wait a minute. And then we learned at that convention that they were actually putting out a, a special edition 20th anniversary DVD from Lionsgate. And no one had told us. Surprise. So – <laughs> so yeah, was like, it really was a surprise, and um, and then that comes out and goes bonkers, and we're opening that thing. You know, we released that DVD at San Diego Comic Con and had like a thousand people come by to get autographs and 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 things like that at San Diego Comic Con for all things. So we're like, wait a minute, and that was really just a year, year and a half after that screening and we really thought as a cast and when I say we I mean like me and Ashley Bank and Ryan Lambert and to some extent Fred and we kind of thought it was like oh this is kind of cool maybe this will last a year or a year and a half and you know then people forget about it but hey we you know people are people are smiling at us and want to take photos this is kind of cool this is a little good little ego stroke for a year and we thought it would kind of wane or die off and peter out and <laughs> We were completely wrong. It not only didn't die off, it just kept getting stronger and stronger. And that led to meeting more and more fans in person and, you know, on social media and online and realizing that this movie did have some sort of impact on them. And then you start realizing that and then these stories kept coming in and these people are telling you what this movie and you, whether it's Ashley or Fred or me or Ryan – you're sitting there experiencing all these amazing personal stories about their experience with this movie. And then I got to the point where I realized that that was something interesting, something unique, because I wasn't seeing that across across the aisle with other movies at conventions and special appearances. And I realized I don't remember what day it was, the aha moment, but I, I realized that those stories were a story. And I wanted to look into that. And that's what led to the documentary. Exactly. Um, I mean, well, I, I can say for myself, uh, uh, I've been a squad member since probably I was four or five. Um, I'm one of those cases. So a very long time ago. Yeah, I'm not going to get my age either. <laughs> um, I was a case where um, going to the local video store and my parents picked up a video. Well, they like monsters. We just showed them the old classic universal monsters. So they'll probably like this. And did not realize the horrible mistake they made by showing a four-year-old <laughs> that. But um, but it stuck with me throughout my entire years. And I kept going back to that video store. And I remember it was on the Vestron uh, VHS. Had yeah. the, had the uh, Unholy trailer right before it. And I'm like, this is <laughs> a trailer that shouldn't be on a kid's film, but okay. <laughs> unholy. Got a prayer. And then we had that horrible time period where VHS is gone and they wouldn't release the Monster Squad on DVD. So what do I do like everyone else? Go to eBay and get a bootleg. Right. Um, and I will then end up being there opening day or the day it was released on uh, the Lionsgate DVD at Walmart. And got it immediately. Yeah. And I, I think what I find about this movie is like when you're younger and of course you just, you want to watch a cool monster movie about kids killing monsters. But then when you get older, you see the the subtext of like the, like issues with family and you know, your, your so parents, yeah, your parents in the film are going through marital troubles and the life of an overworked cop and, um, horses character arc about him standing up to the bullies and everything like that. And also the importance of the Phoebe character at the end. I think that's what really 
people hold on to, what really makes the impact. No doubt. And I think as and, and I think that's sort of one of the keys of the longevity of the connection is that it it continues to grow with with, you know, viewers like yourself, because, you know, every other couple of years that you watch it or see it, you see something different or see something new and it affects you even even differently. Mm -hmm. And now we're getting into kind of the the era where. I have, you know, been talking with a lot of fans that have seen it, you know, a million times. They can talk about every part of the movie um, and then we can chat about something and they find like, oh, I didn't think about that. Now we want to watch it again. Or, hey, Andre, let me tell you something. Um, I, I know this movie backwards and forwards, but I, I now have a six year old. And I've watched this movie from a complete it now affects me from a totally different perspective of being a parent. Mm hmm. And now I see this whole other thing, and now it's this movie. It, it's a completely different movie to me. Right. It doesn't negate what I used to like about it as a kid, but now it's a whole other perspective. And I was like, it just adds that's to an it. Interesting dynamic too. Absolutely, it, it it just adds to it and makes it such a well-rounded, great story. So I gotta ask, what? I mean, I know that. Uh, you know, it was it was kind of mismarketed because it might it like it cancels its audience out, sort of, doesn't it? Like it it's you know about monsters and they're very traditional looking. You know, Dracula's got a cape, uh, Frankenstein has boots and bolts in his head, um, but it's also kind of violent for a kids' film. So and it also didn't have great one sheets with the wanted posters and stuff like that. So do you think that? I guess overall what I'm asking is like who, for lack of a better word, was to blame for kind of like the mismarketing or did they just not know what to do with this kind of film? I, I just think it's all – I don't think there's one thing. I think there was like five things that conspired to not allow this movie to be successful in the theaters. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned what you know they had kind of parallel yet contradicting marketing campaigns. Yeah. Um, uh, it had um, – content that a lot of kids that would either they read a review about it or watched a trailer and said oh i'm an i'm an older teenager this is too much for kids for me and then the other kids were like i'm a little kid this is too much for me this is old, older kids so that narrowed your audience uh but also the thing that really you know didn't help was getting a pg-13 rating right and because no parent because you had to have a parent go with you to see a PG thirteen, right? And no, you know what parents wanted to do on the weekends is not go to the movie with their kid. They wanted to drop you off at the mall or the 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 dual screen in the shopping center, and then they go off on their own while you're watching a movie. And, and you know, not to say that the movie theater was a babysitter, but you know, a lot of parents are like, okay, you four kids, we're all gonna, you're all going to go see a movie. I'm going to drop you off, and I'll meet you here at two thirty when it's over. And, you know, what parents can be like, oh, I don't get to go have the mimosas with you because I've got to go into the theater with these six kids. Right. You know, that group didn't go see the movie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and even though they may have wanted to, I also, you know, so the rating didn't help. The marketing campaigns were contradictory. Uh, I think the timing when it came out conspired to hurt it. And then also the look, the major thing that probably led that, that group of conspiratorial paths is the fact that in 1987, the way the studios and the movie theaters defined success was what happened in your first 48 hours? Mm. You know, you don't have, you know, if, if it reaches some arbitrary number that somebody makes on a spreadsheet, oh, this is a kid's movie, it's about, my, okay, it should make X amount a month or whatever the theater says, if we don't sell this many tickets in the first 48 hours, then uh, it is out and we're putting something else in. Like, get 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 the next movie, you know, in the projector. Mm -hmm. And I think that's super unfair to a lot of films because a lot of films, and look, our, not the marketing and the review, another thing that conspired is most of our reviews were negative. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There were a handful of good reviews, but most of them said, this movie sucks. No. And you should go see it. <laughs> you know, I'm the film critic in Des Moines, and this movie you should not go to. It's like, and who is this film critic? 
oh, it's probably some beat writer that had to write movie, you know, because sometimes a lot of people get assigned to write, and they're not film critics. They don't know anything about film. They don't know anything about genre. They don't know anything about kids' movies. They just didn't like this movie. Right. And I think that happened a lot. And obvi- and I'm obviously correct because, interestingly enough, there was a writer uh, that reviewed the documentary, and it's really one of our only negative documentary <laughs> reviews because this writer, who was at a big, still at a big paper, still at a big paper in a big city, and this reviewer uh, reviewed the documentary, hated it because he still hated the Monster Squad. Oh, jeez. Let it go, man. I was like, are, wait, which movie are you reviewing? Like, what if the documentary like lambasted the Monster Squad and said this movie was the worst thing ever? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, you, and you should give, you should like the documentary. <laughs> I mean, obviously it didn't. But the whole review was about – I've had a lot of people and in, in online commentators and bloggers talk about the doc and they're like, yeah, this wasn't very good because I hated the – you know, the Monster Squad sucked. Well, that's not for you then. <laughs> There's two separate things and you're supposed to be you know, critical review and have you know, some sort of you know, uh, a, you know, not be so subjective. Right. And, but that's what's interesting. So going back to the fact that a lot of reviews were bad – that kept a lot of people away. So you had the marketing campaign, you had the subject matter, you had parents not wanting to go PG-13, and you had this uh, whatever arbitrary line of success by um, movie theaters and uh, you know a studio marketing exec uh, putting a, a, an amount, a ticket sales amount on whatever movie it is, but especially Monster Squad in you know August of '87. Oh, it didn't reach that. Pull it. Let's get out of here. So what that didn't do, and I think this is the ma- the the most major impact of all those five or six things that I've listed, is the fact that, let's say, Steve, little Stevie, little Stevie, because he's you know, let's say he's 13, 14, and he goes to see this movie at the mall with his friend Jake, and they ride bikes and they go see this movie, or the parents drop him off and they get to see it. And he goes to school on Monday and goes, hey, everybody, I saw the, the this movie was so much fun. I loved it. I'm going to go see it again Saturday. You got to come see it with me. And they go, oh, cool. I didn't go. Yeah, that sounds awesome. And then they go to the mall or the Cineplex and it's not there because it got canceled. Yeah, exactly. Because mm-hmm. it got pulled because it didn't have an opening weekend that was sufficient enough for whatever arbitrary number got put there by some executive in some office. Um, and what that did is that kills any chance of being a word of mouth success. Yeah. Now, if you fast forward a year when now the movie's in the video store and it's on the shelf or it's on HBO and these kids see it and then they tape it. And what happens? They pass it around the neighborhood. Exactly. And then that kid tapes it off HBO and passes it around his neighborhood. Or like Aaron goes to the video store and rents it all the time because the, the, the staff is like, oh my God, you got to you got to see this movie. Or your friend said, I just rented this movie last week and you got to go to a video store and rent it. Now you're realizing that this movie is connecting with kids watching it and it's a word of mouth movie. But we didn't get that in the theaters. Exactly. They didn't even give it a chance. Like, No, I mean, I think the longest it was in the theater was three weekends somewhere. Oh, oh that's wow. not even a fair and, shot. And that, and that was long. <laughs> that was the Gosh. longest. And so now we have a different type of kind of barometer for success because imagine, you know, 13 or 14 year olds going to see a movie today and then getting on their Instagram or on their Twitter or on their Snapchat. Yeah. It's instant. And they track that now. So like, oh, you know what? People are talking about this movie this weekend. Let's give it another weekend. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Uh, well, not now because there's, you know, movie theaters are just coming back to life. But, you know, in the context of, you know, the, you know, pre, you know, pre uh, pandemic times. But I think it, I, I think if they had let it breathe a little bit and get that word of mouth and and listen to the neighborhood and listen to the schoolyard, they might have had a box office success. Yeah. Because five or six kids that next weekend would have told mom, dad, we, you, we, you know, we all got to go see this movie. Please take us to this movie. And as you know, all parents were like, get to some point like, oh, my God, if you'll stop talking about it, then yes, we'll take you to the movie. Yes. <laughs> and I think, you know, kids back in that day, I think they did. And, you know, a lot of kids that saw it in the theater, they all said the same thing. And we interviewed a few in the documentary. And it gets represented 
uh, by Joe Lynch, the director, who remembers what theater and what time of the day he went and saw Monster Squad. And that theater happened to be sold out. So much so that he sat in the corner front row and looked up at a weird angle to see a Monster Squad, loved it, and just thought it was the biggest movie of the summer for him. Mm -hmm. He didn't read box office numbers or the Wall Street Journal or you know daily variety to get trade information. Uh, these kids just thought this movie was huge and they never understood you know that and then they're surprised 30 years later when they see the documentary and realize oh this movie bombed <laughs> i yeah exactly and i could totally relate to that i um when i was in third grade i remember the teacher um wheeled in the tv and put on an episode of math net from <laughs> square one tv yeah <laughs> And all of a sudden, I see uh, Sean on the screen. And I stood up in the class, and I went, that's Sean from the Monster Squad. And after the teacher yelled at me for interrupting the class, yes. literally everyone in the class later on went, what's Monster Squad? And I couldn't believe it, that I was the only one who recognized you, and no one knew what I was talking about. Did you jump on them like you jumped on me with it? Even more so because I was in third. Class even more so because I was only in third grade. I was really upset. <laughs> but that's that's not the only time I've heard that exact story. Mm -hmm. I mean, even with the MathNet thing. But you know, especially you know, uh, <laughs> and look, MathNet is honestly probably one of my favorite things that I ever got to do after the fact. I thought it was lame and corny doing it, but then you you watch it and you're like, you know what? MathNet was awesome, <laughs> and I'm glad I got a chance to do an episode. Um, because I, uh, it's the only time I've ever sang on camera, mm -hmm. and I'm not a singer, but I watch it today. I'm like, oh, I, I, I sang that pretty good. And you learn how to do math. Exactly. <laughs> it's fun for everyone. And the voice of Darth Vader is the boss. Right. <laughs> so, you know, James Earl Jones is on MathNet, so yeah. that's good. Um, so speaking of um in terms of, like, Wolfman's Got Nards and everything, I, I watched it, and I'm like, man, there's a bunch of people on this a lot of original um the makeup artists and cast crew everybody so i'm really curious was it hard to like get everyone on board for this or was this something that you were like hey i'm wanting to make this documentary and people were just like yeah let's do it and they just kind of flooded in well starting at the at the the easy top of the list you know it's like ashley and ryan because we've been appearing together for 10 years at that time. Right. right. And I was on the road, you know, I see them all the time and I, they know about the concept that I, I ended up thinking there's a documentary here. And then I ended up doing a deal with Pilgrim media group and actually doing it. And they're like, Oh shit. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I don't think they would have said no, even if they wanted to, because I would, have, I would have made them do it. Um, but, um, no, you know, you brought up the awesome, you know, it's awesome that you brought up like the effects artist that built the creatures because it's an it's it's a major part of why this movie was awesome exactly. and why this movie people still talk about because it was a paradigm shift in creature effects um, uh, at the time and all these guys twenty something year old kids just a few years older than I was <laughs> making this movie learning how to you know recreate and reimagine and and make from scratch new monster suits which are na which set the tone for the next 20 something years right. of how to do that. And that's why these, those guys, those six or seven guys that all worked with Stan Winston are now the icons and legends of the industry. And they all have these big, you know, effect shops and they are literally Titans of their industry now. And they were just young, trying to figure it out and, and, and working on a, a really cool project called the monster squad. Um, they jumped at the, you know, it's, uh, I love the fact that, um, you know, Steve Wang and Matt Rose, who passed away a couple years ago, uh, we got to go to Steve's shop and sit down with those guys. And then we got to talk with Tom Woodruff and how it affected his career and Shane Mahan and John Rosengrant over at Legacy FX. Mm -hmm. uh, they love the opportunity to sit and talk about stuff, especially Monster Squad, because it was so pivotal for them in their careers. But hardly anybody ever goes to them to talk about stuff like that. Really, they, they never get the, the they never get the accolades or the limelight, especially for something back in the day that everybody thought was a dead title. Uh, and little also do they know 
um, or little did a lot of people know that this is the film that was one of the things, if not the thing, that literally set their careers on fire and, and, and made them who they are today. And that's really what you see in the documentary. There's a lot of people we could have had on camera. Um, and there could have been, you know, a dozen other celebrity faces that we could have put in there for the sake of having celebrities tongue bathe Monster Squad just because they were fans. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a conscious kind of effort to to whittle it down to the only – if you're on camera in this documentary, it's because you, you were impacted or affected by this movie in some way, whether you're a fan or you're the filmmaker and everywhere in between. Exactly. And, uh, you know, Sands, obviously, you know, uh, you know, a detail oriented person will point out, it's like, well, you have Zach Gallagher and Christina Klebe in this movie and they weren't in it and or had anything. I was like, no, you're correct. They're in it for a second because they're setting up the context of fandom and genre and connections to their titles. And it's a segue into, you know, a, a section with ours. And and I kind of like that fact. Um there are some amazing celebrity faces and names that are huge Monster Squad fans that I would love to have in my documentary. Mm -hmm. um, some were unavailable. Some just didn't even return the request. Um, but I, I also don't know at the end of what we ended up putting together if they would have made the cut anyway. It depends right. on what they had to say. True. <laughs> you know, it, it's hard to just put a celebrity. It's easy to put a celebrity in your documentary just because their face. Mm -hmm. right, yeah. Um, and look, there, like I said, there is a ton of amazing faces that – could have, you know, could have been or, or wanted to be in this documentary. And it, you know, it just didn't happen because of timing or I didn't know that until after the fact, which sucks. Like I ran into who was actually an old friend of mine. Uh, and I told him and I was just rapping on a documentary about, he's like, wait, dude, you're making a documentary of Monster Squad. It's like, well, it's a Monster Squad. It's not a documentary on Monster Squad. It's actually on the, the dynamic of the fandom and the 30 year history of how this movie stayed alive and what it meant to people. And he's like, why aren't I like when my interview? <laughs> I was like, dude, like we're kind of done. It was like, do you want to do an interview? I was like, I would, uh, you're kind of huge. I would love to have you. Like, when do you want to do it? And then he's like, wait, you know who else wants to do You know, I guarantee you. And I'm like, wait, stop throwing names at me. <laughs> he's like, oh, I'm going to call him right now and tell him to hang out with you. And, uh, that was actually a, an awesome it's Joe Manganiello <laughs> yeah. and who I was friends with Joe Manganiello before he was Joe Manganiello. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he was just this tall, really good looking kind of, you know, uh, you know, actor that's just starting out. And, uh, uh his manager was a friend of mine and it, me and my best friend who was an agent, like we all hung out together for two or three years. <laughs> and so it's like Joe and I, I used to drive Joe home because we lived on the same side of town. It's so like after we're done hanging out, it's like, all right, Joe, I'll drop you off. Let's you know, jump in the car. And <laughs> awesome. then he becomes Joe Manganiello. And I didn't know this until years later. It was like, he was a huge Monster Squad fan. I was like, dude, we hung out for years. I was about to say, it, it never <laughs> came up. And he's like, man, I, was, I never would have said anything. And I was like, uh, okay. Um, now you're huge. <laughs> and you do this awesome stuff. Um, like, can I be on your show? <laughs> like, can, can I be in your next movie, please? Um, and, uh, but you know, then it's, it's people like that that start naming all these other people. And there's some awesome, like I said, some awesome names out there that are Monster Squad fans that I just adore. And, um, uh, you know, I, I get to interact with them on social media sometimes. I've become actual friends with them because we got to interact on social media sometimes. Um, some people are in the documentary because we got to interact and it, it was a good fit. And, you know, like I have a, we're pals. We're, we're more like social media DM pals than we are. Like we get to hang out and have lunch all the time because he lives in a different state. But, um, like Rob Kirkovich on NCIS New Orleans, which is a great show. Um, he's a huge Monster World fan mm -hmm. and we kind of were Twitter friends for a year or two. And then we happened to be in a film festival in New Orleans and I invited, I was like, Rob, you got to come see this movie. And so I met Rob at the premiere of uh, Wolfman's Got Nars at the Overlook Film Festival. And it was the first time I ever met Rob Kirkovich in the flesh. But we've been friends like on Twitter for like two years. So, you know, it's awesome. And I would have loved to have him in the doc, but I didn't know him when we were making it. Right. And it, it's just cool stories like that of, of what it leads to and, and, and cool conversations down the line of who you find out happens to be a Monster Squad fan. Uh, you know, that you learn 20, 30, five years later. <laughs>
You see, you never know. <laughs> no, you never know. And there's, like I said, there's some, you know, I, and everybody always wants to know who's the one person you didn't get in the documentary that you would have loved to have. And the answer was Ryan Gosling. Oh, wow. Ryan Gosling? Why Ryan Gosling? Because he's a huge Marshall Squad fan. Oh, well. <laughs> See, um, I didn't know and, that. And now, and yeah, now I think he's, he's working on a Wolfman. He is. Yeah. yeah Everything doing, comes full he's circle. He's doing the Wolfman. And, and, and what's interesting is, you know, we've, because, you know, you read an article and a quote that Ryan Gosling um, chose, you know, people like Ryan Gosling get like 38 scripts thrown at them every month. Mm -hmm. And um, they get to choose what they want to do. And he chose to do The Nice Guys uh, because he said the guy that is writing and that wrote and is directing this movie wrote my favorite movie of all time. Wow. And his name is Shane Black and yeah. he co-wrote The Monster Squad. And I was like, wait, Ryan Gosling's a Monster Squad fan? Wow. <laughs> I was like, actually, that tracks. He's like the right age. It works perfect. <laughs> and uh, me, uh, a, a media friend of mine has Ryan Gosling on camera, you know, shouting out Wolfman's Got Nards. <laughs> and, you know, during an interview for a junket one time, I was like, wait, really? <laughs> I was like, now this is cool. I want to hang out with Ryan Gosling. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and and I, we had tried to reach out to him and, and didn't get in touch. And I, I finally asked Shane if he would – you know, reach out to him and see if you'd be interested in sitting down. Um, and this is after I actually met Ryan Gosling in a coffee shop uh, and I just interrupted his grilled cheese with his friend. And um, he had no idea who I was. <laughs> oh uh, and then it, 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 about two minutes later, it, it, it clicked and dawned and like we just had a great time chatting for like five minutes. And then I let him go back to his grilled cheese and, and coffee. And um, it, he was making that movie First Man, I believe, at the time. And it was just... Not, the availability was not there. And I was like, uh, I would have flown to Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan Gosling. We flew everywhere else. Uh, why don't we go get Ryan Gosling? But, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's cool to know that there's a, you know, a bazillion monsters on the globe um, that aren't famous. And, and then there's a handful of people that are, and there's no difference between any of them. So one thing I got to ask, um, I noticed in this documentary, but also in the documentaries that are on the DVD as well, is the uh, absence of Robbie Kiger. And uh, and so I also noticed like Patrick kind of becomes the forgotten member of the squad. Has anyone tried to reach out to him or is he just not available? It, it became an availability thing um, back in the day, but even during kind of like you know, appearances and convention runs and and all that, um, he was just sort of non in, in, incommunicado and, mm. and and not reachable. Uh, and then after a couple of years, uh, he he made an appearance or two on his own, um, but just it just never connected and clicked, you know, for different reasons. And when it came down to um, you know, kind of making the documentary, we reached out and we weighed the balance. And like I mentioned before, um, you know, anybody that's on camera or does that is, is also impacted or affected by this movie and or the resurgence and, you know, has some commentary on it. And I would have loved to have Robbie, you know, on camera for it just when we were making the documentary, which is actually a very small window. Mm -hmm. Most people, you know, most documentaries are made over a long swath of time. And we made this in a very, very compressed amount of time. And... I think Robbie at the time was living in Hawaii for years and kind of like non, like I said, incommunicado, didn't have any connection with him. Uh, and then he had moved back and then we just have a hard time. It just, it just didn't, it just didn't pan out. Uh, we've been in contact with him, you know, uh, you know, tangentially and through, you know, you know, one off people that are mutual acquaintances over the last, you know, you know, two or three years. And, you know, you know, every, you know, wishes everybody, you know, like, Hey man, hope you're doing well, you know, yeah. Uh, hope things are good and, you know, hope to see you around the bend or something next time or maybe with the next thing. But uh, um, just, you know, just didn't connect. Uh, um, you know, same thing a lot of people ask about Michael Faustino. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Michael, um, you know, has always tracked like kind of the resurgence and the convention thing and always comments on it. And when Ashley and I or Ryan and I would get back and he'd be like, hey, man, that trip looked fun. Uh -huh. um, and, and I'm always like, do, do you want to go to these things? <laughs> it's like, why don't like, because if it was like, I'll like when I'm doing my deal or something, it's like, are you interested in having Michael there? Uh, and, uh, you know, honestly, Michael, you know, would respond to be like, Hey, right now I'm just busy with what I'm doing. Uh, this is also just not necessarily something I'm necessarily interested in right now, maybe later. Um, and that's totally his call. Mm -hmm. uh, what a lot of people don't know about Michael is, um, 
he he actually stopped acting um, at I, I think like the ripe old age of like fourteen or something. <laughs> you know, he's like he was like this isn't I'm not interested in this right now. I'm going to do other things. And then you know he graduated high school and you know went to school and he became a, a, a audio engineer. He's a sound guy. Oh wow! And so that's what he's been doing for the last you know twenty something years. And he works on giant TV shows like and live performances. So he's like a, a live performance sound engineer uh, for shows like The Voice and American Idol and and award shows and things like that. So oh, wow. he's out there you know rocking it, doing something that. I have no idea how to do, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but you know, I'm grateful that people like him do because I get to enjoy those cool, you know, performances and you know, I hope there's, you know, this day that we all get together and you know, Michael and Robbie and we're all sitting in the same room and cause that's going to be a good photo. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But you know, that happens sometimes. And, yeah. um, you know, and then of course, you know, Brent Chalem is no longer around to right. even have that opportunity. So, you know, that's a whole other, uh, that's a whole other, uh, sucky conversation mm -hmm. so in the light of things like stranger things or the theatrical it movies why haven't we seen any resurgence of monster squad being a reboot or remake which i don't want a remake please no but why haven't we seen any kind of um resurrection of the material um the the short snarky answer is you have and you just mentioned them Exactly, ah. but exactly, but since like th yes. th this so, movie, so n now here's the here's the uh, 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 intellectual professional answer. Um, most of the stuff with Monster Squad about either rebooting or or uh, continuing on or any other type of uh, content has always been a rights issue. Mm. Mm. Uh, Monster Squad's rights have always been in question for like you know a lot of people when Lionsgate. When we did that cast reunion screen, Lionsgate didn't know they had the vi the video rights to the Monster Squad. Wow. wow. And then someone said, hey, they just had this giant thing, and it's getting really popular, and they're headlining conventions now. And I just saw in this drawer that we had a piece of paper that we own the rights to this. We should put out a DVD. Hmm. That's how the DVD came out. Lionsgate didn't even know they had it. Um, and at that time, the rights were split. The title rights were split somewhere else, and the video rights were at Lionsgate. Lionsgate took advantage of it, put out the DVD gold mine. Wow. Uh, and then it was out of print. You know, it, it made three runnings, and then they just didn't do. It. And then, like, it, it then the DVD became a commodity. <laughs> yeah, right? and which was ironic. Uh, and it's always been a rights issue. Now, in two thousand eleven ish, uh, they were remaking the Monster Squad. It wasn't a. Re it was they were remaking the Monster Squad, updated new stuff, new script, new kids, uh, and that was Rob Cohen, who was Rob Cohen, who's a huge producer and big studio director. Uh, who was also a young producer on the original Monster Squad, ironically, hmm. said, hey, this thing's getting popular, let's remake it. So he went to uh, Michael Bay's company and they were remaking it. Uh, much to the chagrin of a lot of the fan base and a lot of the genre audience, they didn't want Michael Bay touching their favorite. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can <laughs> um, see that. Even though I don't think Michael Bay was going to be directing it, but it was out of Platinum Dunes and Rob Cohen. Rob Cohen was probably going to direct it. And that went into like script development kind of turn around, um, you know, hell. And I think the timing of Universal Studios announcing that they're coming out with the Dark Universe, mm. right when they've had, you know, kind of trying to develop and crack the story of a reboot of Monster Squad, uh, when Universal announced that they were doing Dark Universe, then Platinum Dune said, um, well, if Universal's doing the same thing, there's no reason for us to remake Monster Squad, so this project is dead. And apparently everybody rejoiced and, you know, cheered to the streets. Uh, so the reboot of Monster Squad uh, was dead. Uh, and then a short time after, the Dark Universe died. I was about to so, say, after one was, film. <laughs> well, you know, technically it was two. That's what a lot of people don't know. Um, everybody said it, would, uh, it died after The Mummy with Tom Cruise. Uh, the reason Tom Cruise was in The Mummy, in my personal opinion, is because the first Dark Universe movie, no one saw it. And so they said, oh, shit, is Tom Cruise available for the second one? Hmm. Would that have been uh, uh, the first Dracula Dracula Rising? Or? Was, dra was, was Dracula Untold. Untold, yeah. And that didn't perform well. So they said, oh, my God, uh, call Tom Cruise. We need Tom Cruise. <laughs> 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 Apparently. That's, that's how I see the conversation going in, 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 my, in my pea brain. And, uh, but this, this, so they both died. Now I think tangentially, they're, or, uh, you know, off the subject, they're doing the dark universe right now. Mm -hmm. They're doing it the way they should do it. 
smaller budgets, better filmmakers, better, story, better storytellers, and then you get stuff like Lee Wan A Visible Man. You're doing it right. Mm-hmm. That's how you do this. And uh, you don't give some filmmaker seven bazillion dollars to make a creature feature because then it's going to suck. Right. And if you don't believe me, I will refer you to The Matrix 2 and 3. <laughs> uh, first one, genius. Second, third one, terrible. Yeah. <laughs> Why? Because they had a blank check. Um, and that ne- that's never good for, for creativity or storytelling. I think they're doing it right now. Now you update – you come into the last couple of years with Rights of Monster Squad, and it's still a question. Um, actually, there is some updates on that that I am not at liberty to discuss because it's not my – um, it's not my thing. Mm-hmm. Um, hopefully they'll be, you know, making some announcements with something in, in the next year or so. Uh, but for years, uh, Paramount said they own the rights to Monster Squad. But apparently if you ask them to show the right that they couldn't, um, even though they were getting all the licensing fees for like five or six or seven years. From Monster Squad. <laughs> um, and we had to deal with Paramount when we were making Wolfman's Got Nards. Um, and... Uh, you know, we got all that great BTS footage uh, that no one had ever seen before, except for a little bit in the in the you know, the 20th anniversary DVD. But we used other stuff that wasn't in that. Uh, so I love the fact that we got access to that, and that was all through Paramount. Uh, but but it's always been a rights issue. But like I said before, you know, Fred and Shane have been over the last three or four years, especially when they were working on the Predator. Uh, got asked he was like hey do you have a monster squad sequel um you know do you have a monster squad series like we'll do it right now mm-hmm. and they're like oh well what do you what do you see that being and i know more than one conversation and, and one that's the funny story i i think uh was at a place that should be named nameless but it rhymes with um uh Fetnix, um <sighs> that like, you know, the people were in there like, no, I think it's a group of kids and they, they have like monsters and they got a band together. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think one of the conversations was like, you know, sort of like Stranger Things. Oh, God. God. And Fred looked at him and said, Fred said, you want me to you want us to make something like Stranger Things, which is made in the vein of something that I already made. <laughs> See, <laughs> you want me to make something that was made something off of something that I made. That just doesn't really interest me. And he's totally right. And then there was another conversation, which I think it was quoted in, in a couple things, which was hilarious, that uh, they're like, well, what do you – like, what do you see this being? Like, what do you want? And, the, you know, the studio or the network exec or whatever was like, well, I, I see it in this group of kids. Uh, you know, may, maybe they're a little bit older and they've got to revisit what they did and they've got to come together and um, they've got to fight the, fight the monster. And – Shane Black said, oh, that's it. And the execs were like, yeah, exactly. That's what we want. <laughs> and Shane Black said, no, that's it. <laughs> the movie, Stephen, it, that's the movie It. Oh it's already been done. Like they're do- it's, been, it's been doing doing right now. <laughs> and no one ever really got it. And now granted, It goes way back, obviously, to the books and it predates Monster Squad, the movie, uh, you know, in, in some, you know, some forms. But I think it was just everybody – was looking for that pile on of this kind of group kid 80s nostalgia. Mm-hmm. And they're like, yeah, Monster Squad, let's redo Monster Squad. And the original two guys that created the source material for a lot of these things, or reference material, if you will, said, we do something, but it's not going to, like, let's think of something cooler or better. Right. Like, why are we redoing something that's a redo of what we did? Like, mm-hmm. we're not exactly. interested in that. And I, they're totally right. And uh, now, you know, who knows? I, I, I think there's some great opportunities there, uh, even if it has nothing to do with me. I'm not being selfish because there's no guarantee that I'd be involved in anything. Mm-hmm. And there's no reason I should be guaranteed. Um, you know, whether it's an updated story or a current day story. Um, and look, anybody that's ever listened to me blather on about this on a podcast before uh, knows that there's a really, really cool sequel story. Uh, on my laptop <laughs> and you know I, I, I put it together after years and years and years of talking to fans and 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 and, and hanging out with you know Ryan and Ashley and, and and talking about really cool things that could be I think it's a I think it's a great concept um, whether that's the sequel that ever becomes Monster Squad I don't know I doubt it uh, it's not my thing to to make um, I love the story of what is Dracula doing you know because 
in the Monster Squad, a 1987 movie, it ends with them blowing it. Like it opens up with the 1887 band of freedom fighters blowing it. Like they blow mm-hmm. it. Like somehow they blow, blow it. And we don't explain it because they cut the scene. The scene was they stake Dracula, he gets away. And so he's been running around for 100 years waiting for our midnight, you know, our, you know, Friday night, whatever it is at midnight so he can, you know, win. Yeah. And so he's been walking around for 100 years. What has he been doing? Exactly. I want to see that series. Yeah. That's I, I I would love to see that series too. Like, cause I've, I think I've brought it up on the show where like what happened or how did he find the amulet? How did it get to America? Like there's a ton of area you can examine. Yes. Yes. And I think his, you know, I think there's a cool kind of, you know, there's a, there's a lot to do there, you know, without giving away kind of like concepts or plot points, but you know, maybe there's an organization that's trying to defeat him over the years or keep him at bay or maybe something like Dracula has been involved with all of the bad shit that goes on for the last hundred years. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, Wonder Woman, the first one kind of touched on that, you know, with having, you know, uh, Greek mythology blend in with actual gods being involved with the evilness that, you know, is in world wars. And I thought that was a, a great concept. And, you know, maybe Dracula's involved in all, you know, a bunch of bad shit. But he's also, I think he's a... You know, he's built wealth and a real estate empire over the last hundred you know, because that's all he gets to do. And he has stashes of people and things and gold and, um, you know, maybe not silver, but maybe he's hoarding silver so he can't, you know, defeat his his armies. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, and that that concept with me always kind of started when everybody asks, where did Dracula get dynamite? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, what are you talking about? He's freaking Dracula. It's like I, he can get dynamite wherever he wants to. He's Dracula. And it always keyed with me that he pulls out that dynamite out of like this amazing like suede or leather kind of pull pouch. Like yeah. sack, sack. And I'm like, that sack's not new. <laughs> and I'm like, you know what? Maybe Dracula got a – maybe stole a bag of dynamite when they were building the Panama Canal. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm like, this guy's been walking around for 100 years. He can get dynamite wherever he wants to. He's got plenty of time for resources, so. <laughs> right. I mean, and granted, you know, he's Dracula. I love a flashback scene where he's actually having, you know, champagne with Alfred Nobel when he invented freaking dynamite. <laughs> you know, it's, you, why not? He can. He's immortal. He's been around for a while. Exactly. Um, you know, maybe maybe that's some of the original dynamite on the planet. That's a cool story. <laughs> Uh, that he proceeds to love five kids, uh, or he thinks, you know, so like you said, that movie, that movie gets kind of dark. There's a lot to, there's a lot in there. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> so the next question that I have for you is what are some projects or something that we can look forward to for the future from Andre Gower? The hundred year Dracula walking around story. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. <laughs> I would I would love to make that. Um I don't know. Oh, I do have a question. How are you on batteries? How are the batteries doing? Oh, how are the batteries? We're doing great actually. We're doing fantastic. I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. See, yeah. See I always say something about them um, dying and then they behave. They make me look bad. Exactly. Well, <laughs> you always have to have that warning. Um the you know, currently I'm uh, now that sort of shutdown time is kind of reemerging. Um, ironically, sort of in the same month that all the lo- you know the broods of locusts are coming out again. Uh, you know, all the all the people that are pitching projects are coming out of their underground um, cicada broods. But um, I'm always looking at projects. I have you know a handful that I developed you know a number of years ago or current ones. You're always looking to kind of reinvent things or redevelop concepts or ideas. Um, currently right now, one of the lead projects is I'm a producer on a feature film that Henry McComas, who, uh, is kind of one of the main driving forces behind Wolfman's Got Nards, he wrote and is slated to direct and I'm a producer on that. And I've liked the concept and I, you know, that's one thing I, I enjoy doing if I can is helping other people get their stuff done or finding ways to, um, improve their chances. Uh, so Myself and Wes Caldwell, who was also on Wolfman, uh, are producers on Henry's project because I want to see him um, get his first uh, script that he wrote, narrative script that he wrote, done, and his first, uh, you know, um, uh, narrative 
directing job, you know, in the books there, so to speak. And so we've been working on that for like the last year and a half or so. And I think we're in another, we're, co we're coming out of a situation that I don't think was, uh, it was kind of locked up with something for a while that I, I was like, oh, let's, let's hurry up and, and get out of this kind of quicksand with this situation so we can get it back out and, and, and find people that are interested in it. I think coming out of the pandemic and the shutdown may be a neat opportunity for this project. So we're working on that. Um, I have a couple other, I'm, I'm always coming up with ideas, like I said, and I've got one television project that uh, is the main reason I moved back to LA six or seven years ago that still hasn't been done. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's a great concept that, uh, you know, revolves around former child stars. Oh, and, wow. um, Sometimes, you know, they say, write what you know. So um, not only did I write what I know, I, I, I wrote what I enjoy. So it's a blending of those two worlds. And that's, that's a great concept that I hope will pick up some steam here with some cool people that, you know, have said they've been interested in it over the last year or two. Nice. But, you know, also I'm, I'm working with a, 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 an, a, a friend of mine uh, who I've known since high school uh, who is now a manager and he's got a, a roster of great clients. So we've been sitting around batting ideas of, you know, creating things specifically for them or, you know, what projects do I know about that they may be able to fit into. So it's, you know, the world's starting to turn again. And then what that means is that my brain starts, you know, gets a chance to turn again. So that's always fun. And that, that's where I that's where I find myself enjoying the day. If I'm not if I'm not golfing, then I want to be, <laughs> uh, you, you know, kind of uh, seeing ideas and putting A and B together, and and finding awesome projects to champion or either be involved in or you know pass along to other people that you know can make it happen. Um, I, I I have a there's a. There's an author friend of mine um, named Jason Murphy, who's a really cool dude and and writes real, uh, wrote a really cool book called The Black Goat Motorcycle Club that uh, I've been championing for for a long time. And and I want to see that get made somewhere. And uh, those are just kind of specific examples that, you know, I don't mind giving them a shout out because of, I don't have anything to do with the getting. I want someone to do it because the, it's cool stuff and I want my friends to succeed. Okay, so the game is, these are kind of, like I just said earlier, these are kind of obnoxious questions you might get thrown at you at cons. We'd like to see if you can answer them or if you've even been asked them before. You, you can pass. Um, but there are five ridiculous questions. Number right, one. Let's go. All right, number one. How did the Gill Man get into that lake? Look, the Gill Man going to do what a Gill Man do. <laughs> <laughs> Who are we? I mean, obviously, you know, Creature from Black Lagoon, who he's supposed to be, is, you know, from the Amazon. Exactly. And, um, you know, how did uh, the shark in Jaws, which is funny because I now call it the shark in Jaws because his name wasn't Jaws. Um, the shark in Jaws got to Nantucket. Yeah. You know, it's like it's way out of his. I mean, he swam way up the Gulf Stream. So what I'm thinking is because Dracula has the power and he can, you know, kind of summon you know, the creatures of the night, so to speak, um, as his uh, kind of, you know, force of minions. Uh, he was probably down in the Amazon at some time and came across him and always had some sort of telepathic connection or ability or power over him. And then when he said, hey, it's getting close, you know, maybe he met him in the 1950s, mm -hmm. you know, um, and uh, said, hey, you know, uh, in about 37 years, um, I'm going to be needing some help because it's the 100 year mark. And so why don't you meet me in any town USA? And um, so you swim up the Amazon, you know, get into the Caribbean Sea and ride the Gulf Stream because it'll still be warm for you. And you can then take a left and you end up in, <laughs> in town square. Second question. Why did it have to be a female to read the spell? Couldn't have any of the boys have done it? Uh, that is uh, a question that is now obviously, like we said, a conversation that is you know we've been having for the last you know 20 years, and uh, yes, it, it probably could have, but where that is you know kind of um, you know originating from is you know old uh, East and West mythology that you know the virginal girl is the you know the 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 ver the the example of purity 
and the example of innocence. And that really is truly the only thing that can combat evil. And a lot of mythology is based on that. You know, if you go all the way back to, you know, even Greek mythology and, and Norse mythology, you know, and, and, you know, even, like I said, Eastern mythology, they have a lot of that, you know, virginal girl conception. Now, was it really very fair that it's just the girl that is the pure virgin? Like, why can't a virgin boy be virgin too? Mm -hmm. Aren't you both soiled if you have done the deed? <laughs> you know, aren't, aren't you both, you know, now? Um, but that's not how kind of culture, uh, you know, conditioned um, mythology and literature and pop culture over the millennia. Uh, it has, and then in the last hundred years, it's been even worse. Whereas, you know, the more conquests the guy has, um, the more powerful and um, enigmatic he is. And the more conquests she has is that makes her worse. And I think that's, un you know, that's totally unfair you know, when you're looking at it. <laughs> Um, and so it, sh it should be celebrated the other way. But now what it does, is it opens up the conversation of, yeah, we just didn't know. Uh, but it also leads to some good comedy that you can, you know, that you can tongue in cheek that now by shedding a light on that or, you know, throwing open the shades of the absurdity of it. Uh, but it was just all based on literature and mythology, um, obviously some biblical you know, stories there, too. And that was just what the conditioning that everybody had. All right, number three, who would win in a fight? The Losers Club, the Goonies, or the Monster Squad? Duh. <laughs> <laughs> Is the right answer. I'll, I will quote Ryan Lambert with this answer. I won't even get into, well, it gives him a little bit of mine. Uh, it only brings in the Goonies, uh, which is unfair because a lot of people think that there's like this Goonies Monster Squad rivalry thing between us. Like, you know what? They honestly don't give a shit about us because their movie <laughs> was a giant hit. Mm. Um, and, you know, there, there is no rivalry. I love every single one of the kids in the Goonies. Um, and look, I auditioned for the Goonies. So, no. you know, but if you're comparing the stories and the movies, there's not really any comparison. There's nothing to do with the individuals that played the roles of the characters. But, um, the, the Goonies are great. You know, they saw a threat. Uh, they banded together. They're the only ones that really had, um, you know, the enthusiasm and the energy to combat the big bad, which was a developer. And, you know, they didn't want to see their neighborhood turn into a golf course. Um, the Monster Squad saved the world uh, from fucking Dracula. So I don't That's Ryan Lambert's quote. That's not mine. So <laughs> said. You, can, you, can, you can take it from there. <laughs> <laughs> and then number four do the other monsters have nards uh, well i think we learned that gilman may not um, should have nards and he has something else because we saw the example in shape of water uh, oh, um, yeah. <laughs> that was a funny uh hand gesture yeah a little, little, little uncomfortable <laughs> um but our gilman sort of looked like a ken doll you know like in this suit but obviously you know there's he can't be just of his own kind. So I think there's like a like a Mrs. Gilman around. She stayed at the Amazon. I was about to say, did, did she stay back in the Amazon? She did, or, or who knows? Maybe she wanted a trip to the state. Like she was like, I've never seen the, you know the Gulf Stream. Let's go up there. And <laughs> so they did. And like, hey, look, in the you know southern U.S., there's a lot of tributaries and swamplands, and let's go see Hilton Head Island and Charleston. And I heard Florida's nice this time of year. Um, well, then so you ruined I, I their vacation I, by going on business. Yeah, well, he, well, it, don't, don't. It, that always happens. That always happens. So maybe there's like a, a tangential, like you know, comic book of what Mrs. Gilman was doing during our time, and then Gilman got dead, and she's on her own. <laughs> so now she has to meet. Like maybe she like ends up with a platypus in Florida or something. Like I don't know. <laughs> Obviously, Dracula does because, um, in my mind, uh, he has a bunch of vampire brides, and <laughs> that would be a waste. Right. And um, I think there is. Um, this is a little hint to cool stories. I think I think there are Dracula offspring. Oh. Mm. Um, so he definitely, definitely would. Um, a Wolfman, we have proven. Mm -hmm. um, Frankenstein, it just depends on if Dr. Frankenstein, uh, as he was, pardon the pun, Frankensteining his creature together. Um, see what I did there? I kind of netted the, nice. the, the joke. <laughs> and um, if he took, you know, part, like all the parts. But I think the dead body, like the core of the dead body, probably didn't have his junk removed so he probably does have nards they just weren't originally his so that's a whole other weird thing 
All right, and the final question is, why does Stephen King rule? Well, I think Stephen King rules uh, because I don't know of anybody else that can constantly spew forth giant tomes of work on a constant basis <laughs> <laughs> and still have an army of fans. Um, and I think that's it. I just think he's... I, I mean, how many more prolific writers um, that haven't written the same thing? Like, he can sit and write the same thing over and over again. Like, some of my favorite authors, on, you know, in my kind of, you know, escape kind of shoot 'em up spy movie no, or spy novels or whatever you want to adventure kind of tales, th they're the same guy. They're kind of the same story with new bad guys. And, you know, you write 20 chap you know, 20 novels of that. Or take, you know, take, like, uh, I love Michael Connelly's... Um, Harry Bosch mm. novels, and because Harry Bosch is, I think, is a very interesting character, even though it goes way, way back to the early '90s. Um, and, and now the TV show is awesome. The tide is well over, but uh, or the Amazon show It's not a TV show. Look how old I am. It's a TV show. <laughs> and um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get a lot of people into watching the series and then go read the books. But look, it's the same guy. There's different stories, right? Stephen King may revisit some stuff or connect some universes, but that dude's mind is completely jacked. Yeah, <laughs> like it, it comes from a whole other. I think he got dropped off with the other mothership. <laughs> <laughs> so that's probably why Stephen King goes. And nah. you know, and then it takes, you know, who would have thunk, you know, some, you know, just throwaway character description in a movie script would have, you know, become a, a, a piece of movie iconography as a T-shirt. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> exactly. That I was, want one that of those T-shirts. That was not a planned thing. That was not a planned thing. I want one of those t-shirts so bad. I'm not gonna lie. Thanks for playing. All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and um, wrap up here. I can't thank you enough. You are awesome. I love talking to you. Well, I appreciate you having me on. And look, it's it's fun to, you know, talk. Thank you for talking about Wolfman's Got Nards, you know, uh, which, you know, by the way, if you live in the U.S. and Canada, you can watch it on VOT. Uh, let's not forget the shameless promotion here no, do uh, it. but yeah pl please go see it you know if you if you if if you're a monster squad fan uh please enjoy wolfman's got nards it was made for you and about you and really about the dynamic that this movie has on the fandom uh and how the dynamic that the fandom has on the movie uh because it's really kind of a, a two-way relationship there and we we love hearing from people that see it uh it's on vod right now uh, you can watch it on iTunes or Google Play or YouTube or your local cable station. And if you're a physical media person, you can still buy you can buy a Blu-ray on Amazon.com or a DVD. Uh, please let us know. Like order it, watch it, and most importantly, even if you hate it, tell a friend so they can watch it, and uh, so they can go rent it or digitally download it. And uh, you know what we're trying to be now is that that schoolyard or that cul-de-sac. You know, spread the word and uh, get people that may not even know there was a documentary about their favorite movie out there so they can enjoy it. So it's uh, it's it, it's not about me talking about it. It's about me saying it and people knowing it and telling their friends in the, in the schoolyard. Perfect. So thank you for allowing me to come on and mentioning it and, um, you know, uh, just enjoy it and, and let us know. And uh, thanks for letting me come on and gab incessantly about <laughs> stuff that I think I know what I'm talking about. And... Uh, uh, I'm looking forward to the next times. So we'll come up with a whole other topic and, and we'll talk for another two hours. Absolutely. Uh, and, and like I said, uh, this was a, a true honor for me. It, again, you, the, your movie and your character, I just I grew up with you and stuff like that. And now talking to you, you're a real interesting guy. And I would love to do another two, three, four hours with you talking about. We don't, we don't even have to touch Monster Squad, just talking about any topic. Let's do it. I mean, if you guys either schedule it or if someone drops out, even if it's last minute, just, you know, you got my email and, you know, now we're Skype buddies and uh, podcast, uh, you know, uh, bondage, uh, not podcast bondage, that's a whole other thing. Um, bonding. We're not um, there yet, Andre. It's okay. We're not, we're not there yet. Uh, um, that's a whole other. Ooh, that's weird. Um, yeah. uh, boy, did the batteries run out? <laughs> I hope the batteries run out. Um, Right, the gut is going to tell you real quick how to bring the horror into your own home with a handmade soy wax candle from American Nightmare Candle Company. The scents are inspired by locations iconic to the horror genre. Places like the Overlook Hotel, Sleepy Hollow, and Elm Street. 
Each fragrance combination is carefully curated to transport you into the story, and the catalog is ever evolving. So head over to Etsy or to AmericanNightmareCandles.com and get 10% off when you use the code SCARIFIER at checkout. This deal only makes sense, so get your American Nightmare Candle today. Hey there, it's Quinn from Scarifier. You ever have one of those days where you're out on the lake and the sun's going down, gazing into the eyes of that special someone, and then you realize, I brought my machete, but no hockey mask. Well, if you're in a rush to make a killing, head over to 13X Studios and get your very own custom hockey mask. Mask creator Rick Stizinski takes a hands-on approach to every order to create the perfect mask to your specialized needs. Why would you settle for red triangles when you can shop an assortment of original styles and colors? Rick's clientele includes Nightmare Toys, Kevin Smith, and Kane Hodder. Head online to follow 13X Studio on all social media platforms. Then go over to 13X Studios on Etsy to put in your custom order today. Don't get caught with your mask off while devising your next decapitation. Go to 13XStudios.com. Scarifier. <laughs> <laughs>